amazing. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, sisters. Such a privilege and an honor to be here with you. And thank you so much, Sarah, for even allowing me the opportunity to share with the ladies tonight. So my title, and I'm going to go a little bit quick because 10 minutes doesn't last long. My title is Resolved to Help One Another. So turn with me to Ephesians 4. The Spirit was working. Regine had the same scripture. We're going to read in verse 7, and then we're going to drop down to verse 11 and pick it up. So it says in Ephesians 4, in verse 7, and let me know when you're there. Amen. It says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Then if we drop down to verse 11, it says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So there's a couple interesting things that I actually learned about the book of Ephesians itself before we jump into the scripture. One is it's written by Paul, and that's probably not a surprise, but, <laughs> but the other part was that it was really written as encouragement to the believers in Ephesus, and it was written to challenge them to function as the living body of Christ on earth. And so it says that some of the body have specific roles, but it also says that some of us are supporting ligaments or joints, it says in other translations. But it says that all of us play a part in the same work. And that work is to build up the body of Christ and to mature it. And we know that, we call it discipling relationships, right? Now that discipling relationship, it can be to, between two people who are partnered together, but it also can just be between two disciples that want to help one another. And God says that we need to help one another to mature and to be trained for works of service. So lately, especially in moving here, I've had lots of opportunities to remember and think back on when I studied the Bible and when I was baptized and um, I always wanted somebody in my life to teach me about God from when I was a little girl. And I just wanted to know about him. I just had a love for God. And then later on as a disciple, I wanted to know how to please God. So I was so grateful that God had given me people in my life that could teach me the Bible. I just loved learning the Bible. And I would say to my discipler, oh, man, I can't wait until my husband disciples me <laughs> and she would say girl you don't know what you're asking for <laughs> it's like maybe I don't maybe I don't but I can wait I mean I love learning the bible and I really love just being able to please my god and that required knowing the bible so as a disciple I and all of us get the privilege of having people in our life to teach us the Bible. And it's free. There's absolutely no charge for that. Regine does not charge me anything when I call her. When I talk to Sharon or when I talk to Sarah sometimes, like no charge, just free training in the scriptures, right? But how about you? How are your discipling relationships going? Right? Are you having your weekly times together? Are you really helping one another to become more like Christ? Are you looking for help? Or are you even looking to be helpful to your sisters? And remember that people are, are never the standard, right? It's, uh, it just keeps us humble 
to know that we're not the standard. And it keeps us humble to continue learning until the day that we die. It's all about helping one another to resemble Jesus. And it's something that we really have to, have to actually be committed to doing. Out of love for God and out of love for one another. So, now there are some things that can really get in the way of us helping one another. And it's important to know what they are so we can make sure that we get rid of those things out of our lives and hearts. So I wrote a list of five things. Um, there are other things, but <laughs> we're just going to focus on the five, right, that can, have, that can really harm our relationships with God and with one another. So number one is called backbiting. Now that's an old school word, right? <laughs> We know that better as the word slander. So I'm going to give you the definition as I go through each one, right? It means to accuse or say unpleasant or unkind things about someone who is not present. So the rule of thumb I was always taught is if you're saying something about someone in a way that you wouldn't say it if they were there, then you're probably participating in slander, right? Number two, gossip. It means casual or unrestrained conversations about others, typically involving details not confirmed as true. Okay? Number three, criticism. The expression of disapproval of someone or something based on perceived faults or mistakes. And the word perceived is key because one man's trash is another man's treasure. Right? So it doesn't always mean that what we see is actually the right thing or how we respond to it. Number four, bitterness or being bitter. And it means ranging from being merely disagreeable to the taste to being poisonous. By extension, associated with it are anxiety and despair. Also, bitterness of spirit and language or harshness. And number five, jealousy. The state of being jealous, feeling or showing envy of someone or their achievements. Similar to that is being covetous, suspicious, distrustful, resentful, controlling, doubting, or defensive. There is literally just no joy in any of those things, right? And I know when I, when I participate with them in my heart, that I'm down, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, like there's nothing I can see good in anyone or anything. And I don't know about you, but I like joy. <laughs> it's fun to be full of joy. Don't you ladies like joy? Yeah. Right? And joy is actually a fruit of the spirit. And those of us who are baptized disciples, we have the spirit and we should be experiencing joy. Uh, so let's quickly turn to Romans chapter 12. And I'm just going to jump in at verse 9. It says, love must be sincere, or the definition genuine. And hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And live in harmony with one another. This is what our discipling relationships should look like, right? All of our relationships with one another, loving one another in a genuine way, helping one another to hate what's evil and to really cling and hold on to what's good, helping one another to be devoted to loving each other, and really helping each other as sisters to honor one another above ourselves, right? And the list goes on. I'm not going to go through it again for the sake of time, but I want you to go through it and really think about this in your discipling relationships. Are you helping your sister to be this way, or are you being this way yourself? Sometimes we got to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first, right? But in verses 15 and 16, um, it says, 
to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And I want to talk about that for a second because we've had a group of us move into town, right? We came into town and we're joyful and we should be. We're doing the mission of God, right? We came in on Operation Jerusalem and so the Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice. But then there's another group of us who was here already, right? And from the conversations I've had, there's some mourning that's been going on, you know? And, and we totally understand that that's kind of why we're here, right? But you guys have been faithful and held down the fort. And we want to give you guys a round of applause and have you stand up if you were here already, and we're going to salute you for your faithfulness. Go ahead, stand up. Don't be shy. We ain't got a lot of time. <laughs> All right, man. Come on, ladies. Amen. That's awesome. And we salute you and your faithfulness. You have stood in the gap and remained steadfast. So both of us, we need to live in harmony with one another. And just be mindful that one of us, we don't want to squash the other one's joy. But the other one of us, we don't want to run so far ahead of somebody who's got a cast on their foot, kind of like Sarah. <laughs> Right? who's trying to walk but has a cast on their foot. So ladies, let's really be resolved to help one another in our discipling and other relationships. I love you guys. Great job. Hi guys, how are you tonight? It's so great to be with you. I've got the title, Resolve to Raise Up. Let's check the time so we don't go over. Okay, so resolve means to firmly be determined to do something. So when you put it together, resolve to raise up, it means firmly determined to lift up or move toward a higher place or a position or a level. And it's so cool and I, that I, I, I ask God, you know, what do you really want me to talk about? Uh, what do you want me to help the sisters to see? And a couple things came to my heart. And the first one was divided we fall. And <laughs> it's in uh, Matthew 12, starting verse 22. It says, When they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see, all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But the Pharisees heard this. They said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And it made me think about the fact that, you know, Jesus came here to rescue people, to elevate his people. He came to serve them by preaching and healing. He came to bring light into the darkness. And, you know, the Pharisees, though, they used um, this time to work to discredit Jesus and divide the people against him because that's what Satan wanted. He didn't want the work to be successful. He doesn't want us to be right with God or with each other. So every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Well, Jesus knew their thoughts. So, of course, what did he do? He addressed them and he said, you know, Basically, I can tell Satan is influencing you because you're saying things that go against what I say. Ask yourself, does Jesus knows my thoughts? What's on my mind? What am I thinking about? I have to do this on a regular basis. I'm not a naturally trusting person, um, and I love people, but I'm not naturally vulnerable because that puts me in a position of them having power over me. And, you know... You know, you have to ask yourself, what's on your mind? Are you thinking about supporting the kingdom? You know, and you're supporting your brothers and sisters? Or do you have other things on your mind? Right? Do you struggle with resisting? Do you fight to join in the movement with Jesus? Because you're looking at flesh and blood. I had to memorize that scripture as a young disciple, right? Ephesians 6.10. You know, that basically we're not fighting flesh and blood, but the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms right, and this dark world. I had to remember that, especially being married, <laughs> because we could be very critical of our husbands, but we're not fighting our husbands. We're fighting Satan. And, you know, we have to fight 
to be united. We have to fight to be joined together. You know, are we getting rid of sin or are we trying to get rid of our brothers and sisters? I think about Cain. That could be not my natural heart. Like, ooh, she's prettier than me. She's smarter than me. She's more talented than me. She's more outgoing than me. I don't like her. Because she makes me look bad. You know? Satan tries to go after my confidence as I get older. My jowls get a little saggy. You know? And I start to get some wrinkles and my eyes crinkle up. And I'm like, the youth are going to really judge me. They're going to really look down on me. Aw, so sweet. <laughs> so Satan tries to tell us all these things, right? And he knows our thoughts, so he goes after him and he attacks us. And he tells you, yeah, just, just lay down. You don't matter. Just be lazy. Just be self-seeking. It'll feel better, right? Nobody cares what's in it for you anyways, right? Um, just go ahead and give in to that jealousy like I talked about early. Judge others because, you know, it'll make yourself feel better. Because if you compare, I mean, obviously you're a little bit better than her, right? And we can be foolish because we have a lack of knowledge. And so we're kind of like idiots <laughs> because we don't know better, right? It's like <laughs> it, we just don't understand some spiritual principle because we're not deep in the word. And we're not putting it into practice. And so we really got to go after getting rid of our sins and not our brothers and sisters. You know, Satan looks for excuse and God finds a way. Satan puts doubts in our heads. He says people are fake. Their motives are bad. They're selfish. They're all in it for themselves. They think they're better than you. But God tells us to trust. Yeah. Satan tears down, but God builds up. Yeah. Have you ever, like, been in a group dance where you're trying to make this dance really well and you want to perform and someone's messing around? And you're like, knock it off. We're trying to get this together. We're trying to be succinct. How about when you're drawing a picture and someone walks over and scribbles it, right? <laughs> You're making a sandcastle and someone kicks it over. Or my favorite, I'm folding all the laundry, which is irritating. <laughs> no, it's not that bad anymore because I make my kids do their own laundry. But, um, but you're folding laundry and somebody just, you know, the kids come over and just knock it over. Somebody knocks it over, right? You're doing a project and the others don't get involved and they're not ready for their speech and you're like, sheesh, isn't it frustrating and counterproductive to be divided? Well, that's what Satan's trying to do in our hearts right now. He's trying to get us to knock down each other's work, not to be in a dance together, not to make disciples together, not to encourage, not to love. It's really frustrating. Don't let Satan do it to you. Kick him out of your head. I have to do it on a regular basis, guys, on a regular basis. You know, because we're not fighting flesh and blood, right? And it's really cool just to think how much God loves us and how much he wants us. Imagine, like, if you had a team. You're a baseball coach. You all the players, right? They're on the field. But you have to keep putting them back in their places. They keep wandering off from first base, second base, shortstop, catchers. And they're like, we're going to win. And you're like, no, you're not. <laughs> right? Who likes to lose? Do we want to be a bunch of losers where Satan is just manipulating us because all we do is let him control our thoughts or our feelings? No. Go to the word. Find the truth about yourself. You're awesome. You know why? Because Christ already raised you up. Let's look at Ephesians 2. How am I doing on time? Okay, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. We'll read that real quick. Okay? So good. As for you, sisters, you were dead in your transgressions and the sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We're not those people. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. And, we were, uh, and um, when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You're already raised up, sitting with Christ in the heavenly realms, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us. How are we doing in our kindness like Christ, right? No attitudes. Let's be kind. We can say, I'm, I'm hurt, you hurt my feelings, I'm mad at you, but I still love you. 
I say it often. Ask Lori Anderson. <laughs> she says it to me. You know, for it, in verse 8, for it is by, by grace you have been saved through faith and is not from yourself. It is a gift of God and not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, creating in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. And I just wanted to talk about that. God raised us up with Christ and seated us in his heavenly realm with Christ Jesus. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He didn't just raise you for the, from the dead so you could live for yourself. He raised you from the dead so we could live for one another. Doesn't that make us happy? Don't we want something from one another anyways? Right? So when we're taken from each other, we're not happy. But when we're given to each other, we are. And Christ raised you up for that. You're already raised up. Can you be resolved to be raised up? Of course. You're already raised up. You already have the victory. You know, one of the things, uh, some of the ways that we can do this to be the best that we can be as servant leaders in God's kingdom is by serving one another. Write down Galatians 5, 13 and 14. This is how we show reverence and worship for God. It talks about, you know, humbly serving one another. It takes a real heart for each other. Encourage one another. The Bible talks about doing it daily, right? Write down 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 and Hebrews 3, 13. This keeps our hearts soft. God says it keeps us from being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And then confess to one another, James 5, 16. This heals us and unifies us. How, how can you really be hard with somebody when they're pouring their guts out, right? When I talk about all the things that I'm not good at and the things that I've hurt God with, you just bonded with me naturally. I'm bonded with you. The first thing that sister does to me when I first meet her, she comes and confesses her sin. I'm like, oh, I love her. <laughs> I really love her. But you know, the last thing we'll talk about real quick is raising up to guard the family of God. This is so important. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. Let's get there, 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. It says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Now this is really interesting because I don't know if any of you guys have looked up what a guardian is, but a guardian is someone who's entrusted to train a child. They're a slave who is in charge of the child's life and morals of that child, of the family's ch children. So it's almost like someone who's been enslaved to take care of this child to make sure they're morally correct. So this could be someone who's maybe a young disciple, but there's also fathers and mothers of the faith, right? There's a little difference here. A slave is not as invested, they're not blood, but they're entrusted, and we need to be guardians to one another, but what we really need to do, especially some of us who have been around a long time, is to be mothers. Be mothers to the guardians. Help make more guardians. Guardians take care of the young. Mothers protect, they defend, they sacrifice. Don't mess with my babies. You won't like it. <laughs> they, they work towards their children's success. And they're very patient and gracious. You've heard moms, you're like, they always brag about their kids that can't see anything that they do wrong. Is that how we are as mothers towards one another in the faith? Or do we say, oh, you know, rah, 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 there they go again, right? Oh, there they go showing off. Don't we like do that with our kids? Look, look at my kid. You're like, stop it. <laughs> we don't your kids are as cute as you think. Yes, they are. It's my kid. So you are as cute as I think you are because you're all my kids. Is that the heart we have as moms in the faith that have been around a while? How are you guardians doing? Are you guys teaching and helping people, the, your sisters, with their morals, with their lives? Are you helping raise them up in the things that they're doing? You know, we got to be kind and guard God's house, which is made for each other, because it's our family, yeah. right? So when you're tempted and Satan comes to you and tells you that you're weak and you're not good enough, remember what Jesus said to Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. If you feel weak, God is strong in you. Yeah. If you feel like you can't do it, God's got you. Why? Because he already raised you up. So I really want to encourage you to remember that greater is he that is in you than is in the world. 
Decide to raise up. And I did, made a little acronym for you to remember, SEC, <laughs> S-E-C. Take a second to serve, to encourage, and to confess. To be great because he is great that is in you. Thank you. I want to close out real quickly. You know, sometimes practically we need a way to repent or we, we need a way to serve or we need a way to be raised up. So in the back, I mean, on the table, I'm going to have sheets that you guys can sign up for if you want to participate and serve in audiovisual, in Kingdom Kids and Teen Ministry, Bible Talk Assistants or Bible Talk Leaders, Administration, Mercy Worldwide, um, Ushering, Cyber Ministry, Prayer Warriors, Song Worship Ministry, and last but not least, Shepherding. So thank you. I'll have it in the back for you guys. You guys can sign up here. Well, oh, you guys are so encouraging. Well, you know what? I wanna, I wanna try something different. So I'm gonna try to use my computer tonight. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, I've been, um, you know, I said I've been staying the Bible with this woman, and um, she's, you know, being honest with me. And I wanted to give her a notebook, and she says, you know, I use my iPad. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna use my my MacBook. So anyway. But I've got my real notes here, so just in case I need them. But no, I, I really, um, I'm just so thankful for this time. It's really family time. This is what this is all about. And I'm really, really grateful and thankful to be talking tonight about resolve to reset the standard. And what's the standard? It's simply the word of God, you know? I just, I love these campaigns because it really gets us encouraged and revved up. <clears throat> and um, this campaign, I know, is going to just create a church that is healthy, that's fervent, and that just creates even more fruit. Um, and just in such a short time that we've had this huge transition in LA, you know, we've been able to restore faithful leadership and faithful preaching in the church. And we've also are finally growing. We haven't grown for a long time. And that's not an insult, it's just the truth, you know? This is a journey that we're going on. It's not as easy as it sounds sometimes, you know, to be fruitful, but we are very fruitful. And that is so exciting. And the other thing that we've done is we've made sure that everyone is getting discipling. That means everyone has a discipler. And if you don't have a discipler, come see me or Sarah or one of the shepherds because we want to we wanna make sure that you have a discipler. But now it's time, like I said, to reset the standard in two areas I want to talk about. You know, we got to remember first and foremost, we're a kingdom of the heart. And what that means is that God wants us to be committed with all of our heart. Okay, and so what are we going to do? My first point is just everyone committed to all the meetings of the body. And I love that the Spirit is working like Pam said because Acts 2, 42 is my first scripture. But I just want you to write that down because we just read it. Acts 2, 42 through 46. And it talks about how all the believers had everything in common. They, they sold their possessions. They, they were just so excited to be together every single day. This is a scripture that I can talk about because I have memorized this scripture. And this scripture motivates me to come and to be to make sure that I've been a disciple for well over 20 plus years. So it's my, it's my heart and my commitment to make sure that the church looks like this. And you know what? Right now our church is not totally unified because not everyone has this conviction to come to all the meetings of the body. And we're going to do something about that. It's our standard to, this is not a suggestion to come to the meetings of body. This is, it's been lost, and people, instead of getting in the habit of coming to church, they're in the habit of not coming to church, because you know what? It, it just, it's hard. It's a journey 
You know, you've been doing this for a month, and some of us have been doing it for 30, 40 years. And we got to have that same commitment. And when it comes to commitment, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Because you know what? Jesus taught as regarding commitment. He taught absolutes. And this is what I love. There's no murky, like, does he mean, like, all the meetings of the body? <laughs> but, you know, you look at, like, in the discipleship study, you look at Luke 9 and Luke 14, and he says you must do this or you must deny, deny yourself, and or you cannot be my disciple. It's not like a negotiation, you know? It's like you cannot. The other thing I love about Jesus, you know, when he's telling people, follow me, follow me. And this guy, you know, with a pureness of heart, and I felt kind of sorry for him because, you know, we got the Bible, we can read the beginning and the end. But what happened is Jesus said, follow me. And he said, well, first, can I, Lord, can I go and bury my father? And, you know, Jesus was absolute. He said, no, follow me, follow me. And I know this sounds insensitive, but he says, let the dead bury the dead. But he doesn't mean that insensitive. He, you know, there was a reason that we won't get into right now. The other thing, when they invited him to the um, banquet, you know, you read that, that in Luke 9, there's so many excuses. And these people are not committed. We have to really get the conviction that it is an honor to be in the kingdom. It's an honor. And you guys, I need you. You need me. We need the church. We need the family. And we really gotta, we really gotta have that conviction. Do you realize also in the in the word of God, it says many are called, but few are chosen. If you're in this room, you're chosen. And just think about all the people in the world and look how small this room is. And you have been chosen, and even if there were 500 or 1,000, it would still be a very small group. And we're going to get there. But three convictions that we need to have about um, commitment, I'm just going to ask that you write these scriptures down. Number one, Ephesians 2.19, we are family. We need each other. And we need to be together, and we need to really love the fellowship. It might be hard to get here, but once we get here, isn't it amazing? And then number two, John 13, 34. It says that we must love one another. Now, how can we hug one another and and just encourage one another and um, even um, just... I like to kiss people because I'm older. I can do that, you know. And I do. I like to kiss you guys. And how can we physically do that if you don't come here? How can we love you, if you know, and hug you? We can't do that if you're not here. So, and then John 17. It's so cool. It says that in John 17, it says that we have to be brought to complete unity. And we need to get a conviction. I love what Kim said, what Pam said, all those things that they shared. It's about unifying us. We need to be taught by these amazing women how to be unified. Because guess what? It's not natural. It is not natural, even as disciples, unfortunately. The longer you've been in, the more you got to work at unity, unity. And then you just, you know, commitment is a behavioral issue. I love the lesson on Sunday. I was so convicted about where my character is. The no pain, no gain. You know, pain is the only way that you guys can get character, okay? It doesn't matter our upbringing. It is the pain. It is the pain. And I think of like people like Andre Sloan. I mean, that man has character. He has been through so much, so much more than me. He's got so much more, so much more. He has been discipled by his pain. And I love him so much, you know. I think of Women's Day, how Sarah talked about escapism. And this is really real. It's so sad that people want to escape. They don't have the hope that we have. They don't have the opportunity to even know about this meeting tonight, you know? And we get a chance to do this. And I just looked up character, and you know what? It's, it's, I have to remind myself, what is character? It's, it's how we think, feel, and behave. It's not how you look. It's not how articulate you are. It's none of that. It's how you think. 
how you behave and how you feel. And in times of adversity, here's the, here's the secret to character. Don't give up. Persevere. That's character, you know? And if you have that, guess what? You'll be committed. Because you know what? When you feel like not coming here, it's like, I got to go to midweek. No, I got to go to my D time. I just need it. And most of the time, people have to talk me out of not coming somewhere if I'm really, really sick, you know? Because I want to be here. I want to be here. I really want to be here. You know, sometimes commitment, too, we think it's like we got to be full of joy. I love Selma's message last week or two weeks ago. But you know what? She did also share sometimes joy. It's not always joy. You just have to say, I'm going to be there. It's got to, and this is about denying ourselves. So this is kind of sad, but I want to quickly share about some excuses that sisters use. Uh, why they don't come to church. They're really simple. Okay, number one, I'm tired. Number two, I have a headache. And here's another one, and it's just really, I mean, it's, it's really concerning. I'm bloated. I ate too much junk food. And you know what? These kind of things will really, it will steal our commitment. It will, it will really destroy us as a family. And what we got to do, we can't look down on these people, but we've got to get in there, and we've got to help them. Just recently, uh, uh, Michael and I uh, and a region leaders, we got together with a sister that's been a disciple for 33 years. And instead of coming to midweek, she decided to um, be part of a volleyball league. And she thought she was very committed. She had other issues, too. So we were very patient. We just got in there very lovingly. And with the word of God, she finally realized she needs to be restored. She's not committed. But this is what changed her life. It changed her heart. And, you know, what I really can relate to is last year, I, was, I had a lot of health issues. I was, um, I was losing weight in, like, a few months. I, I lost 30 pounds. And I used to wear clothes over clothes so people wouldn't ask questions. Like, I was wearing my pajamas under my pants, under my really warm pants. And I was just, I didn't know what was going on. I was going to the, uh, all these different medical appointments. And they couldn't really find anything. I was, people that were close to me, I just said, just pray, just pray. I do have prediabetes, but here's my point. Not my, not my health, but I didn't miss any meetings of the body, okay? I just, at the, at the um, AMS, not the AMS, the uh, GLC, I was so sick. I was so sick, but I just put a smile on my face, and I just pushed through. And I know Elena even said, you need to go rest. But I was like, no, I want to be here. I want to hear these women preach because I wasn't contagious. <laughs> but anyway, I just think that we really need to have this c- conviction. So here's what we're going to do. Bible Talk leaders now, we're, we're going to ask them to take um, a t- a- attendance is what I'm trying to say. We're going to take attendance. And if somebody's not here, we need to follow up with them. And so the Bible Talk leaders will report back to the leaders and let us know who's here. And we'll see a pattern. And if they're not here, you know, we should be concerned. This is, this is not control. It's not legalism. It is concern for our brothers and sisters. So we need to get behind that uh, family. And then number two I just want to talk about is everyone committed to giving contribution consistently. And uh, I do want to go over to Ephesians 5 and just read this scripture. It's, uh, turn with me to Ephesians 5, and we're going to do verse 3. We're going to start in verse 3. It says, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance into the kingdom 
of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And this, I've lost my place here. I don't know how you guys do it. Okay, here we go. So in this scripture, greed is used twice, okay? And you might be saying to yourself, you know, just because I don't give does not mean I'm greedy. But you know, the Bible clearly clearly says here that immorality, impurity, and greed are idolatry. And I think as a church, you know, we have slipped in our standard of holding each other accountable in our giving. It's really not a fun thing to do. You know, if people have greed, a root of greed in their heart, they're not going to be, thank you for letting me know, or, you know, they're going to be like, why are you talking, you don't understand, they could get defensive, but what we have to do is we've got to, we've got to really get in there gently, and do you know that not giving is one of the first indications of people falling away and slipping away? And you know, that root word of greed in the Greek, it just means desires, earthly desires. I was reading an article today, and it says, I looked up types of greed. You know, what kind of greed is there? And these four main types of greed, just quickly, hoarding, comparison, entitlement, overspending. We're so steeped in these as Americans. And, you know, I know myself over time, I, I had all these things in my life. I was so American. I was so greedy. But you know what? We've got to get this mentality out of the church. We've got to get it out of the church. It's offensive to God, and it steals our generosity. And we really need to get that conviction. So what we're going to do as a church is we're going to raise the standard of accountability of our giving. If someone hasn't given in four weeks we need to sit down and talk about their giving we're going to approach them with love we're going to make ask them is everything okay do you need any help but the expectation is that we must give to god god we've got to convince these people that if they aren't giving that they need to repent because repentance is refreshing. And, you know, here's the heart that we want to instill in everybody. If you're not giving, go to your discipler and just say, hey, I'm not going to be able to give this week. There's a lot of exceptions. It's about the heart. But four times you're not giving anything, nothing. You know, we've got to really get ahead of the game. If you're one of those people here, or if there may be people that need to hear this message tonight that aren't giving, we've got to have the heart just really in love. Ask them if they're okay. Start with that, you know, and ask them if they need any help. Start with that. And then if you don't know how to handle it, get some help. We'll help you with it. But you know what? Here's the thing. There's so much work to do. This year alone, we're going to plant 30 churches. L.A., I love how Jason says this every week. He says, L.A. is sending out Lincoln and Bangkok. We're sending out some of our very best. We're not going, we're going to take care of them. We're not going to say we don't have any money or, you know what, we need, you're going to be okay. We'll send, no, we're going to take care of them. And so in closing, I just want to say, you know, I want you guys to really uh, hold on to Second Chronicles 16.9. Here's what it says. It says, God strengthens. He strengthens those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Let's be fully committed in our giving and fully committed in our meetings of the body. Amen.